Hi guys, welcome to first episode of the greatest movie podcast in 6,000 years. I've, I've ran the numbers, I believe those check out. They're not the numbers. Huh? They're not the numbers. So, okay, no, but did you carry the two? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you, word for it. Welcome to, uh, you know, the, the show. It's the show. We're going to talk about a movie. That movie is Wuthering Heights, the 1939 version, because there's like four versions of that, I think. Uh, It stars Laurence Olivier and some chick. And let's talk about it. Here's a plot summary. So there's dude gets caught in the snow that's probably made out of asbestos. And he (laughs) he comes to Wuthering Heights for shelter. And the uh, guy Heathcliff there gives him shelter, and then the dude thinks he hears a ghost, and he runs, and he's there's a ghost, and Heathcliff leaves, and he chases the ghost, and uh, then you know what? I don't even want to recap this movie because, despite being uh, what is it like an hour and forty minutes? Yeah, yeah. It is. I didn't know that you're asking with the audience. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so it's only like an hour and forty minutes. Uh, which is which is actually like pretty short along the lines of the movies we viewed, but there's literally so much shit happens in this movie. I'm just gonna be like very very summative, and it's basically the stories of Heath Heathcliff and Kathy. So uh, Heathcliff is an orphan boy who's taken in by her father at a young age, and she's his, her father's daughter, and they're uh, they fall in love, I guess, at an early age, and then they fall out of love, or do they at some point? It tells literally the story of their lives. Days of our lives. The days of our lives, and the days of future past. Yeah, I would just recommend honestly watching it or reading a summary because it will it will take like a long ass time to describe exactly what happens in the movie. They both end up marrying different people despite being in love at an early age, and Heathcliff rises through social status. Those are kind of the the two major things, but I figure let's just talk about it. Sure. What, do you have anything you want to start, or should I start with a point? What do you want to do? Do what you need to do. I do. Okay. So a uh, point I'm going to make that that ties in with uh, we're talking about the length, but the amount of stuff happens is I'm going to compare it to another movie we watched, I guess, in episode order recently, but. Um, in actual time, quite a long time ago, which is giant. They're they're kind of similar films where they tell the stories of essentially people's whole lives, or at least their relevant lives. I suppose Giant doesn't actually end with characters uh, dead, but tells the story of their entire lives together. And that movie is like probably got another just straight up like hundred minutes on this movie. But yet they cover both amounts of time. So the reason I think it's so different is because this movie. The reason it gets like a similar amount of, I guess, broad story done in such a less amount of time is because it's very, very influenced by stage, by theatrical acting. Uh, no, I guess so, somewhat no surprise there, Laurence Olivier, obviously a great theatrical actor, although uh, I will take a quick tangent and say I thought, you know, in some of the early Laurence Olivier films, he has a tendency to ham it up, theatrical style. I thought in, uh, in most places here, he, he was. Sh- I think this is the start of his ability to act more subtle for the screen. But yeah, so the way they handle a lot of scenes is that there'll be scenes where a lot happens in the bl- big plot picture, but much of this it'll be inferred from other characters. So, like, uh, shit, was it like, when Kathy gets married, you find out that and, like, X other things in the scene, right? So the right. scene, the scenes aren't f- just for one plot development or yeah, one storytelling moment. They're treated like you know. You look at any play. You look at like the plays of Shakespeare. There's only X amount of scenes in the act, and so characters will come in and out of the scene to get multiple things done with that one scene. Right. Why <laughs> <laughs> oh, you keep saying yes? I don't know, that I, I guess everything you're saying. Yeah, I don't know. That was like kind of the major observation I had about this. The way they do it. I guess I guess you should start by asking you. Did you like the movie? <laughs> I, mean, I mean, it was okay. It was watchable. Yeah, I, I would agree. I would, but I would say that despite being the highest up, technically on the list reviewed so far, it was one of the weaker ones reviewed. Uh, 
I about the same. They all they're all pretty weak in my eyes. What you really liked? Uh, I mean, oh, well, actually, no, because the, what was that one movie in Minnesota? Oh my God! One second. Dances with Wolves? Not that one. That's not Minnesota. Yeah, I know, but I don't. Oh, Fargo, Fargo. Fargo. Yeah. That was a yeah. good movie. That Fargo, was I would the best Fargo's movie on the list so far. Far sure. Fargo's probably my favorite that we've used. I, it was just better written because when I read into Withering Height, like I actually decided to go to the source material because there was a lot of questions unanswered, and there's a lot of reasons for Heathcliff being considered a douche or an ass or a mean spirited person, which they're trying to give. Like go off, but I didn't get. I didn't understand like how that was possible because he wasn't. To me, the the worst thing he possibly did in that entire film was just marrying, uh, which one called sister just out of spite. Edgar's sister out of spite. Yeah. And that was it. But that's you know borderline bad. I and mean, that was it. Like, but when you go into the book, he does so many evil things. It's like it's great. He's, he's, but okay. But with this, it's like I don't understand. Like, like she's saying that he changed like earlier on. I'm like I don't know what you're fucking talking about. He might have talked a little louder than the other guy, but that's it. I don't, I don't. Maybe there's things that go off camera, but I don't know. He does. He does place a curse on people a few times, which I think I, one of them was more sarcastic. I think because they called him a gypsy. I, I think. Yeah. Was, I think it was being more like playing like into that. the stereotype. Yeah. Yeah. Um, think, but that could be just my opinion. Well, yeah, that's that's what's kind of interesting. The the two romantic protagonists are both kind of uh unlikable at times. There Heathcliff has prone to his fits of rage and Kathy is very uh f- like fleeting with her affections and so forth. Like they they go back and forth between being in that kind of like second act of the movie before she actually marries Edgar. Yeah. There's there's that scene where they go back out to uh Pennington Craig, which by the way, the movie should probably be named Pennington Craig. That's like, <laughs> uh, if I'm getting the name of that rock right, because but like, no, seriously, the that rock has more to do with the central romantic story than the actual house. The story was about the drunk guy who he takes the house from, I'm sure, that call it Weathering Heights. But um, yeah, so there's that scene where they kind of rekindle their love on that uh, by that rock, and then the next scene. It's it's literally like a voiceover to like skip ahead, which makes me feel like yeah they were probably cutting the source material for it to make a reasonably length movie, but it literally I think it's a voiceover of probably the maid because she's obstinately telling the story that's the framing device, but you know you know yeah. don't really understand how she knows some of these things. That's right. Yeah, and I think it's a it's a little voiceover and it just says and over time uh, Kathy uh, was drawn back to Edgar, and then Heathcliff comes and they have a fight, and he leaves. And but you thought Heathcliff left earlier, and then he came back, and then was... Heathcliff comes back again, and now he's rich. <laughs> yeah. The 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 second act of this movie is very messy in a lot of places. It really is. It, like I mean, it was flowing okay. It was, but just like the second half definitely was uh, just kind of like it, quick and fast. It was yes. Just... For a movie that takes up so much time in these characters' lives in such little spaces, you're never going to expect the pacing to feel, like, perfect, perfect, but I think the the beginning and end portions of the movie do a good enough job with that. But there's that middle part of the movie where they're both adults after Kathy, um, after the dog biting scene up until probably where um, Heathcliff and uh, Edgar's sister become interested in each other. The Everything that goes on in between that, yeah, the dog scene and that, it, it feels very, very time skippy and like the the Cliff Notes version of a story. Yeah, it just like I hate when they always do this. Like this is my biggest issue with uh, older movies. They always have these like they just tie in ending, which is like really quick, get all the loose ends and just tie them up. But you know what I mean, like cause, like the ending was kind of like really cliche. Uh, you're referring uh, to the, uh, the kind of uh, the backs of them walking off. Yeah. I didn't. I don't know if that was in the novel or not. But That's think... actually. The, I do know for one thing that apparently, because I didn't do research into the novel, but I did do research into the production of this movie, and part of what I read about was the director actually didn't want that scene in the movie, and That's the producer, stupid. the <laughs> producer put it in, and so the the Heathcliff and Kathy that walk off into the snowy. That's their. Those are body doubles. Like the movie was wrapped and done. And a producer, you know, went around uh, the casting and just says, do you have anyone's back of the head who looks like Lawrence Olivier? Oh, good, we'll take him. Throw it in. <laughs> Great. <laughs> there, there were, and apparently there was, like, some drama on set with um, 
the two leads of this movie, Lawrence Levy and Merle Brown, were not fans of each other. Uh, fought fought on setting because another thing because this movie was originally going to be filmed with uh or not who originally i believe it was originally intended for merle oberon it's a thing for her but when Lawrence olivier got casted he wanted his uh his wife or maybe they weren't wife and husband yet but vivian lay to um, perform with him in the movie and she she wanted to do it as well uh, and the studio vetoed that, and so Lawrence Olivier was like a little upset with that, and Merle Oberon was a little upset for, at Lawrence Olivier for not, you know, considering her to be his choice for the film. And uh, yeah, tensions flared on set, I guess. Ooh, Ooh. like that. There is her death scene, which the death scene is, I guess, strangely romantic in ways. It's it's a little odd. And also, do they specify exactly how she dies? She just gets sick, right? Quote unquote, she's uh, ill. I think so. The that plot device death. But that's I yeah the, I I suppose that probably comes from the source jail. That's a very Victorian literature thing to do and have have them grow ill suddenly, and not yeah. specify farther. Because it doesn't really matter how he dies, but the issue is you don't see how her death really affects Heathcliff totally beyond what you infer from the scenes from the future, because directly after she dies, that's kind of the end of the story. And they go back to the present that takes up the beginning and the end of the film. So you, I believe you see his wife is still around, but she's not, I don't think she has any lines set in the, in the present. Mm. Like you don't yeah. you don't know what how this affected the lives of these people. This should be kind of a major event. Like what did uh, her his wife's brother Edgar like react to all of this? Like I don't know. I don't know. I, don't know. I felt like this movie this movie takes up so much time in these people's lives yet leaves a lot of questions unanswered. I agree. <laughs> hey, what can I say, man? It's, uh, that's what it was. Yeah, this, we're agreeing too much about this movie, apparently. Because it's just like, uh, it's uh, you can understand why it's not on this list, uh, on the main list. And I don't understand why you even made it on the list in the first place. I know, you know, it's just, like, I don't know. That's a tough, like, it was rather high. I would guess. I mean, I could put a Transformer movie on the, on the, on the, like, on the not list, too, and it would be equal to this. I don't like Transformers, but I think, like, the, the you know, story flows is just... As better and it's a little more understandable. Also, it might be even more entertaining. I think I think that the reason the movie was on the list and primarily the reason why this movie is still in like I would recommend people watch this. You know I I don't think it's a it's a fantastic movie but it's not a bad movie is on the strength of the acting. I think even though it's very stage like at times there there's still yeah there's a lot of good acting and the dialogue for the most part is well written it's just we don't uh we don't really get a ton of the dialogue but it does it does flow naturally the way they interact <laughs> uh what what can we talk about with this we could talk about um the the throwing of the rocks i guess throwing the rocks yeah yeah throwing of the rocks so it's a good one so it's a good one that's that's how you get um what's it called eczema <laughs> eczema eczema it's true I don't know. And by that I guess I meant um, talking about uh, Catherine's brother Henley who plays kind of an interesting role in this movie because you don't know what happens in life so he after his father dies when he's young and he becomes master of the house we time skip ahead to him as an adult and he's a drunk and and eventually he drunks away like all his money and he gets he gets the house get the property gets bought up by Heathcliff who keeps him around to spite him. That's kind of uh, a bad thing Heathcliff uh, does. I I guess. But although he is still putting the man up in like a nice house, I suppose. yeah, great. Yeah, he's not, he's not making him do any work either. He's just yeah. paying for his booze. But to Hindley, I mean, to Hindley, it's kind of the ultimate humiliation to now have to serve Heathcliff, who he. Well, he deserves it because he's a fucking idiot. Fucking right. spending all that money away, <laughs> stating everything. And but another thing, we don't find out what happens to him after um, Catherine dies because we don't see him in the future. And I think that part of the reason Heathcliff kept him around was because he wanted to feel some kind of attachment. Still, like that's the reason, obstinately, that he um, he marries Isabella, is that he still wants to be connected with Catherine, even if you know he 
doesn't even possibly desire them to be together anymore. He desires a connection that she, you know and that she can't escape. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it uses it as their just like association. Oh, that works. That works. That works. I think it's complete bullshit, but <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I just feel like Heathcliff's not a bad guy. He's just misunderstood puppy dog. Just a misunderstood puppy dog. Anyways, so um, that's pretty much about it. I would think. Pretty much about well, we can always do what we do. Oh which, my god, the awards! The awards! So we, this man will never forget the format, even when we start recording in a year later. Um, <sighs> the Academy Awards that we received. As we get into more modern movies, there's stuff like uh, yeah, you know, there's I, plenty I, of awards we could go over, but we just choose the Academy ones. The reason I choose that is because with these older movies, the Oscars are really the only form of like long, uh, long-term recognition since that. So let's go over this. This movie. And the Saturn Award goes to? <laughs> the Saturn Award goes to. This Big movie best. only won a single award, which was for Best Cinematography, Black and White. This movie came out in 1939, so... Before that, they had Color. Um, then they said, um, Hipster, <laughs> let's go for the Black and White, and then they went back to Color afterwards. That, uh, it was a very weird time for this. <laughs> um, we had a monkey in the office of prison. Okay, sure. Yeah. But so they separated the category between color and best and black and white, and this movie won. Oh yeah, it would have come out around the time color was coming out. Yeah, 1939. So yeah, about the heyday. And it was also nominated for plenty. It was nominated for best picture, nominated for best director, nominated for best actor for uh, Lawrence Olivia as Heathcliff, nominated for best supporting actress Geraldine Fiz. Gerald as Isabella Linton. Uh, interestingly, not nominated for Best Actress for Merle Oberyn, but do you know who was and also won the award? That um, year? Vivian Lee for Gone with the Wind, who they didn't allow into this film. They chose Oberyn over her. Oh man, maybe she, they should have gotten her. <laughs> and uh, But then we wouldn't have Gone with the Wind, probably. You would have both. <laughs> what else? And there was also nominated for Best Screenplay. Best original score and best art direction. I will say the score for this movie is uh, pretty good. I enjoyed it. Um, it's kind of a good classic Hollywood score. Yeah, I remember I recorded the um, the our, us watching it. Yeah, we did like an awful riff tracks, which like I don't understand why you want to do this. We had Tyler there. Well, well all he no. talked about was how it was 1920 the whole time. <laughs> just... No, I, I only want to listen to it so I can remember like like use as notes. And I just remember me humming the theme song on my end, like, every so often. <laughs> it was the stupidest fucking thing. <laughs> yeah, I actually, you know, I had to watch the movie again because I missed, like, half of what happened because of that. Cause just talk over it the whole time. Oh, yeah, we watched it twice. Yeah. Oh, well, one and a half times or whatever. One we, wa- we first watched the first 20 minutes, and Tyler wanted to join in, so he started watching it again. And then, like, a week later, I watched the movie by myself again, so I had a better idea of what actually went on in it. Yeah, it was a good movie. I liked it. It was uh, two out of three stars out of ten. Two out of three stars. Uh, here's here's probably why it didn't win Best Original Score, aside from the fact that there was a ridiculous amount of nom- – they used to nominate a shitload of movies. Yeah, uh, man. But, yeah, how many things were nominated? Five, six, seven, eight – there's 12 movies nominated for Best Original Score, many of them by the same composer. Well, you got to think about it this this way. Nowadays, there's really no original scores that often in movies. That's true. They'll have like a they'll have like a pop song in a kids movie. And that's... Most most indie movies are like or which are you know get most of the least the uh, monthly play like on the cinema because you get like a lot of these low budget films because theaters I mean well move uh, sorry wow I can't think what I'm trying to say uh, production agencies and whatnot need to throw out cheap movies quickly because that's how the name of the game nowadays instead of putting out quality well it's always been the name of the game but even more so now because of uh piracy mm-hmm. um so they, they put these shitty movies out that just have like some hey we'll we'll pay you you independent music guy do some shit for us 10 bucks there you go whatever you know or a grand or whatever you know but that's what it usually is or you get some like Kanye West or whatever and it's like <laughs> Whatever. There, there are exceptions though. John Williams like, still. The James working. Bond movies usually have original scores, and they always get nominated uh, every time they come out, even the, the newer ones, um, because that's just the, that's just the format of it, and it has to be classic. No one wants if if you fucking piss off the James Bond fans, you don't make any money. I mean, they're all alive. Sean Connery won't watch the movies if you don't have that fucker watching movies. What do you, what do you have watching movies? 
I was going to say, there are still some, like, big, John Williams still working, usually with Steven Spielberg. Oh, yeah. Now it is. Hans Zimmer, um, very successful in this past, Johnny I guess, Marr. decade and a half. <laughs> Johnny, well, Johnny Marr, Marr worked with Hans Zimmer for um, multiple movies. Yeah. I believe... Johnny Greenwood uh, Johnny from Greenwood, Radiohead. Radiohead. Yeah, I was just about to say. Um, a couple of the guys, one of the guys, I believe the whole band played on it, but it's accredited to Will Butler and Owen Paulette of Arcade Fire and kind of of Arcade Fire, respectively. They just did her... Which is a very well received film. Well, yeah, but when you think about it, there's very few movies that do it. Still, I mean, we're we're struggling. We got a list, and these are movies in the past decade, not in the past year that we're thinking yeah. of. But you know what? I I I forgot to. The reason why no surprise at Lost is you have any guess? You have two seconds. What won Best Original Score that year? What year was it? Did it come out? 1939. Oh, 1939. Okay, I, I thought we were talking about yeah. Arc Fire for a second. Okay. <laughs> I have no fucking. Oh, Gone with the Wind, right? No, The uh, Wizard of Oz. Wizard of Oz, yeah, it makes sense to yeah, me. The, I, I, oh. would, I would expect The Wizard of Oz, that movie came out any year in the past hundred and so years. I would expect it to win their Best Original Score Award. I guess Frozen might win an Original Score Award, but they just use the generic chords all the time nowadays. Is Frozen? Oh, yeah, that's. I think the, the chorus of that one, the big hit song from Frozen, is the four chords yeah. song pattern. <laughs> Which is a little unfortunate, I suppose. But that's but Frozen original. was a very Broadway style, like yeah. Well, I don't, I don't want to talk about it. I just yeah, we don't have to. We'll we'll have to discuss Frozen on our Weather Nights podcast. But um, what did you know? What my favorite original score of past year, since we were talking about scores past year, I don't know exactly if it qualified because it was kind of a musical. But it seems if The Wizard of Oz won for its score, I would hope it would. Was uh, oh, you know why? It's probably because a lot of it was folk songs, and so debatable how original it was. But did you see the film Inside Lewin Davis? No, I did not. That is uh, tied for well, it's it's my favorite movie of last year, but I saw it this year. Technically, I saw it in January of 2014. But yeah, I, that was my favorite movie of the entire last year, and it's um, it's kind of like a it's got a lot of folk music in it, and the music's like fantastic. The movie's fantastic, and it's by the Coen Brothers who <laughs> enjoyed Fargo. Oh man, this is great! I was just thinking about Harry Potter's original score, and then I was remembering that Twilight had at the end of the of one of them. I forget it was Radiohead's Fifteen Steps off in Rainbows. <laughs> I just yeah. remembered that. You know what? There's some yeah, there's some big budget tween movies. They always they they use these like indie songs. Like indie I tell you, man, I was I'm not bullshitting. I I, I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah, but I was, was because I remember for Christmas this year, my mom bought me the soundtrack to The Hunger Games: Catching Fire because it had like the National did a song on it. It's, it and like I remember the first Hunger Games movie, which uh, that movie's a mess, I think direction wise. But um, the first Hunger Games movie, it ends with this song by Arcade Fire, which is like one a pretty weak song by Arcade Fire. I don't lie. <laughs> Roughly, but like, it wasn't good enough for an album. I'll toss it. Hung- but yeah, it's it's this like try to appeal to everyone's strategy that they do with these movies. They say, oh, we'll get the the big appeal stars you, and the young. Kids young adult novels and then oh but we got to get the hipsters in somehow well what if we say all these people on the score and you know i saw that catching fire movies well i didn't fucking hear the national in the movie i didn't hear monsters and men in the movie like they're just they're just like promotional they're they're promotions they're like song the compilations that are used or, or is in the last 20 minutes of the credits that you didn't watch yeah, <laughs> or it's in the background on a radio that's like a mile away offset yeah <laughs> It's on there. I swear. It's on there. Yeah, that's why I don't. That scores, dude. The, the scores. We've had a, a good score discussion. Is there anything else we need to talk about for Wuthering Heights? I'm trying to think. I really don't think so. I mean, we brought up the book, the source material. You you brought up the uh, production, and that's really all I can think of to bring up. I know. I yeah. I guess I I would recommend. Watching it, I mean, I recommend watching basically every movie we watch because it's, these are well-known movies, and um, you you should make up your own opinion about them. You know, like you know, come in with the expectations of whatever. But you know, we enjoyed this less than a lot of the movies that were ranked lower on it on the list, right? And yeah, at least that one movie, uh, Fargo. Uh, no, not that one. Oh, you mean worse than this? I guess he's coming to dinner. It had a funny title. <laughs> yes. I believe your still is your still least favorite. A place in the sun. The second it's, movie you watched. It's very close. It's still, I mean, Wuthering Heights is not bad when when you think about it, but Place in the Sun is just fucking stupid. <laughs> <laughs> I 
me. I, I, I don't know, man. It just, to me, it doesn't mix with my brain. It just feels, like, retarded. Like, nothing that makes any sense in that movie. It just, it's all stupid. Alright. <laughs> Alright, so, I guess, um... Oh, you know what I will say? Uh, I'll mention one thing. So, there's, you know that sequence before he does the Black Knight fight? There's one thing that yes. really took me out of the movie. Before he does this, like, a little imaginary fight against, like, which I actually really enjoyed that sequence with the music and the sounds, and it felt very youthful, you know? It felt like something a kid would actually possibly do yeah. before they clear log in. So I say the movie should be called Pennington Craig, and, you know, that scene happens there, and it's, it's, uh, and I think it's a great scene, but directly before that scene when they have their horses, this movie is shot, like, I mean, obviously, most of the indoor shot on sets, but they're very nice looking sets, and, and then they have the horse scenes, which are outdoors and filmed. But, you know, those are big-budget shots for the day. There's this one fucking scene where they're using this cheap backdrop right before they go do that. And it's so jarring, and it irks me so much because it comes before probably the best scene that. of that um, younger part of the movie when they're still kids. You, you, you know or you don't know? I know you're talking about. Yeah. I, yeah. It too. I, I don't – I don't – I take it for what it is because I just figure, you know, it's just budget-wise and just – and they're probably – trying to um they probably were inside a studio the entire time just using backdrops and that's obvious what they're going to be doing and they're just taking it from like a stage performance probably and they just kind of just recycled stuff because it's you know it's 1939 right so it's, it's basically what they did back then anyway. it's like wizard of oz had just were massive backdrops it's just yeah that's true but they were they were the wizard of oz quality. wizard of oz is also and it's also placed in a stylized world kind of right yeah you you place this in like um i mean it's a period film uh, i guess it's a victorian novel but it looks obstinately set in like yeah like mid 19th century probably like but i believe the novel might have set parts earlier because it was published they kind of set the movie around when the novel was published, which I think worked fine. Yeah, it has these great, like, Victorian houses. It, it has uh, distinct, like, you always know where you are. It has distinct landmarks. It has outside. I don't know if they actually filmed it in, like, fucking North of England or Scotland, wherever the fuck it is. But it, it looks it looks right. And so when you go with this realistic just approach to everything, and if if you want to use backdrops, that's fine. Then use backdrops throughout the film and, and vary them. But you know, don't do the this one fucking <laughs> thing. This one fucking shot so, that's like so mad. An extra exposition scene, basically. They could have had that dialogue either in the scene directly before or directly after, no problem. Because it's dialogue about those scenes. So I don't know, probably got added in fucking reshoots when they did the ghost shots, anyways, and the asbestos. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't doubt it. All right, so I guess we're we're done talking about this. So I will say we're gonna try and do these. Weekly or maybe bi-weekly from now on. We're supposed to do this last week. We're going to try and record on Monday, and I'll finish editing it whenever I get done. Um, so next week, we will be watching the 1951 film, An American in Paris, which is a full-on musical. Gene I Kelly. actually uh, I want to see this. So this I, is see this. I, saw, I, um, I remember this one song. Uh, I can't remember what it's called, but, it's, I mean, but I know it's like oh, – no, it's Werewolves in London. So I think it's similar, right? Werewolves, <laughs> London, <laughs> American Paris. I guess we'll find out. Though. I haven't seen this movie either. The one thing I do know about it is that the final number is supposed to be very, very elaborate and long and like expensive, extravagant. Good. I'll so, probably not want to watch it. Uh, we'll see what happens. <laughs> All right. Uh, thanks for joining us. Do you have anything left to say, Bosco? Uh, some so many friends. It's too little time. Let to the listeners. No matter what I ever do or say, listeners, this is me now, standing on this hill with you. This is me. Forever! Goodbye. You've just been listening to a Goocast Media Podcast. The greatest movie podcast. <laughs> <laughs>